How many people knew that the chief investigator, Frank Hildrup, said that Senator Paul Wellstone's death was not worthy of a public hearing? Whose would be? Uh, I'm going to bring up to the podium our next speaker, Dr. James Fetzer, who has worked tirelessly to educate and promote and seek justice and hold people accountable for the types of crimes that we're seeing today. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jim Fetzer. Paul Wellstone stood up for us, so why aren't we standing up for Paul Wellstone? We're not sure who said, it's not what you don't know that hurts you, it's what you think you know that ain't so. But we do know who said, the CIA will have succeeded when everything the American people believe is false. That was Bill Casey, Ronald Reagan's director of the agency. And we know who said this, William Colby, among his successors. The CIA owns everyone of significance in the major media. I hope I'm not going to disillusion anyone here when I explain to you that the FBI, the NTSB, and the NIST spend more time covering up crimes committed by elements of the government than they do exposing them and pursuing those responsible. There are NTSB policies that you will not know and will hardly believe when I explain them. First of all, the NTSB cannot investigate a crash site unless it's declared to be one by the Attorney General. This means there's a perfect scenario here for taking out your political enemies. Bring them down in a plane crash and then have a complicit or compliant Attorney General decline to declare it a crime scene. Second policy, NTSB reports are not admissible as evidence in courts of law. For I believe the obvious reason in courts of law they might be challenged, they might be refuted, they might be shown to be rubbish. Because the hard part of an assassination is not to kill a man, the hard part is covering it up. And the FBI and the NTSB and the NIST have shown this, whether it was the murder of a president or the atrocities that killed thousands of Americans or the death of a United States senator. According to the NTSB, since it was not declared a crime scene, and the only alternatives it could investigate were accident compatible, namely the weather, the pilots, or the plane. Pilot error was responsible. The plane in Air King A100 was like the Rolls Royce of small aircraft. It had an excellent maintenance record. There were no problems with the plane. Even the NTSB would eventually admit it much. The weather was just fine. Other pilots had flown into the airports earlier in the day. And yet I was astonished to hear Wolf Blitzer talking about freezing rain and snow here in Minnesota when I looked around and knew that not to be the case. He even made the remark that they had closed the airport for other planes. And that tells you all you need to know about the accident. But we know from many sources that the weather was just fine. Steve Filipovich, for example, sent me two photographs he had taken. He was a pilot involved in real estate across water. Not only was there no freezing rain, there wasn't even any rain at all. The weather conditions were just fine. Eventually, the NTSB would concede that point as well. Therefore, they focused on the pilots. In fact, Richard Connery had 5,200 hours of experience. He had an air transport pilot certification, which is the highest civilian short of astronaut. And he had, coincidentally, 
just passed his FAA flight check two days before the fatal flight. Wellstone, who was a very cautious, anxious flyer, preferred to fly with Richard Connery or one other pilot from Charter Aviation because he had the greatest confidence in them. A fellow pilot who had co-piloted with Connery 50 times explained he was the most cautious and meticulous pilot with whom he had ever flown. And a friend of mine here this evening went to high school with Connery and knew him to be meticulous, obsessive, compulsive. He was a detailed guy. He was an extremely qualified pilot by any appropriate measure. And while Michael Guess, his co-pilot, was not as well qualified, he also was a perfectly competent pilot when the plane only required one. Nevertheless, there were two. Consider, consider the claim. According to the NTSB, the pilots lost track of their airspeed, which of course meant they also lost track of their altitude. And they were off course. They were some 60 degrees off of their flight plan and they were in a wooded area about five miles south of the airport. How could that happen? Airspeed and altitude maintenance obviously are the most elementary properties taught to a pilot as a beginner. Suppose you assume, this is just to illustrate the absurdity of the NTSB position, suppose you assume a pilot would lose track of their airspeed one time in a hundred. Suppose you'd lose, suppose you'd assume a, a pilot would lose track of their altitude one time in a hundred. Losing track of both the airspeed and altitude would only happen one time in 10,000. And to lose track of their course deflection indicator, that would have shown them they were far, far off track. Add in another one time in a hundred, and now you're up to one in a million, and that's for a single pilot, there were two. So the probability that Guess and Connery lost track of their airspeed, their altitude, and their course deviation was one in a million times one in a million. And that's not even to take into account the loud air stall warning alarm that would have let them know if the plane were in any danger. The situation, the story we're given by the NTSB is simply absurd. Just to undermine it, underline it, they found a simulator in Florida with a weaker engine than a King Air A100. They had the pilot, the simulator pilot, fly under the similar conditions at an abnormally slow speed. They could not bring the plane down. That means the NTSB's own data contradicted the NTSB's conclusion. They never considered the possibility of a small bomb or a gas canister or some kind of high-tech weapon. And in fact, as you have seen, there were many features here that ought to have raised suspicion. There was the cell phone anomaly. That's very strange. But from the point of view of the NTSB, nothing suspicious there. Garage doors were open, even though owners had not opened them. Oh, nothing suspicious there. The smoke was whitish blue. Typical of an electrical fire, not a kerosene-based plane fire. Nothing suspicious there. The fuselage burned for seven hours. It reduced the plane to charcoal. Nothing suspicious there. Do you know how many words there are in the 63-page NTSB final report? Three, post-impact fire. And yet this fire was extraordinary, by far the most stunning aspect. The wings had even separated from the fuselage, and it's the wings that are full of fuel, not the fuselage. Nothing suspicious there. And then we have witnesses carrying what sounded to them like gunshots, multiple gunshots, one of whom, Rod Allen, said after consideration it sounded to him as though they might have been coming from inside the plane. 
The FBI told them not to talk about it. Nothing suspicious there. And when John Costell and I went through the 2,300 pages of reports upon which the NTSB's 63 pages were allegedly based, we found that they had brought in a special company to consult on the propellers because the engines were set below idle, below idle, below idle. And therefore the plane would have had no forward thrust, nothing suspicious there. That plane had a glide ratio of 1 to 15. That meant for every, every 100 feet that it were to drop vertically, it could continue gliding 1,500 feet. For every 100 foot drop, 1,500 feet with no power at all. So we have these anomalies plus another that John discovered, namely in the melted area of the ice in the atmosphere. In the ice level of the atmosphere, there was a melted area that was a meteorological anomaly, anomaly that, for the FBI again, nothing suspicious there. How, and how could the FBI show up so promptly? Uh, Rick Wahlberg, who was the St. Louis County Sheriff, saw men from the Rapid Response Force right here in St. Paul he knew personally. When he showed up at 1.30, he asked them how long they had been there. They told him they'd been there since noon. I asked Gary Ullman, the airport assistant manager, how long they'd been there, and he said, well, he'd been on the phone, but they'd been there at least since 1 o'clock. And yet when the issue arose, Paul McCabe, the FBI spokesman, said they had shown up at 3.30, contradicting both the sheriff and Gary Ullman. Very, very suspicious indeed. I was publishing articles about the crash in the, in the Reader Weekly, an alternative newspaper in Duluth. And when I picked up on Christopher Boleyn's observation that the FBI had showed up with preternatural speed, I began a backward calculation. The plane actually took off, the Wellstone plane, at 9.37. The crash occurred at 10.22. In order for the FN, Gary Ullman flew up and didn't even locate the crash site until 11. He didn't even obtain notice the crash site until 11 a.m. and didn't notice anyone. He didn't notify the FBI. He came down and got the fire chief and took him up to find a way to get in there. How could the FBI possibly have shown up by noon I did a backward calculation, Bob Boone, my editor, made me go over it again and again and again. In order for the FBI to have been on the crash scene by noon, they had to have taken off from St. Paul at the same time the Senator plane took off. And I have observed, with those remarkable powers of prognostication, they ought to be in the stock market making lots and lots of money. But then, for all I know, they already are. So he had a vast number of indications that something was terribly, terribly wrong, not to mention that Ron Allen had seen a white van leaving the area at high speed. This is a rural, relaxed Minnesota area. White vans don't rush out at high speed in that vicinity. It was a very special case. And what appears to have happened is John Costella, who has a PhD in electromagnetism, and I had both inferred, it appears they used a high-tech electromagnetic weapon to create a powerful energy field. And what they heard popping were the computerized components in the plane. It would take out the navigation system, it would take out the communication system, it would disable the loud stall warning device. The effects they can have on humans are comparably serious, they can bring about a loss of consciousness, the incapacity to exercise voluntary muscle control, and even death. Something happened, and it appears to have been that this surge of energy, which not only called, caused all those popping sounds, flipped the solenoids, the switches that controlled the pitch, and put the plane below idle, so that it was gliding after that point in time when it crashed, and having done their deed, 
the perps in the van with a weapon hightailed it out of the area. I, I am convinced that this was a very small scale operation, that the only ones involved at the top were Dick Cheney, Carl Rove, and Donald Rumsfeld. It could have been as simple a matter as the member of the board of directors of Charter Aviation making a call to Dick Cheney to let him know that Paul Wellstone would be on the plane. He could, in turn, make contact with Raytheon, which not only owns Beechcraft, which manufactures the King Air A100, but also owns multiple patents for directed energy weapons. The use of the weapon could explain not only the popping sounds, turning the props below idle, the, the, the melted area in the ice region in the atmosphere, but complemented by what I am now convinced had to have been the interior of the plane being coated with either magnesium or thermite or something the equivalent. When the plane crashed, the fuselage burst into flame, completely independent of the fuel being carried in the wings. It burst into flame and it burned so intensely for seven hours. They could do nothing about it. They couldn't even recover the bodies until the following day. So how could the FBI possibly announce that evening that there were no signs of terrorist attack? The NTSB itself would not conclude that the cause of the crash had been pilot error for another year. Another year. And how could you possibly know there were no signs of terrorist attack if you did not even know the cause of the crash? This is a kind of charade that we have come to expect from our government, I'm sorry to say. When I reached the point of realizing what had happened, I contacted the office of Jim Overstar, who of course is a world-class expert on aviation, explained what we had found to his office. The response was to invite me down at midnight outside of the federal building to meet with an aide so there'd be no records, no recordings, no photographs. The situation, I'm sorry to say, is completely appalling. Wellstone was a man of great courage. Wellstone was a man of great integrity. Wellstone spoke up for us. It's time that we speak up for Paul Wellstone. Thank you.